Where does TCU fall in Josh Pate's Big 12 power rankings? We'll discuss that next. Also, TCU basketball takes on Texas Tech and Lubbock tonight. All that coming up here on Locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day. You are Locked on Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day. I'm your host, Stephen Simcox. We're free and available wherever it is you get your podcast. Uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also subscribe wherever it is you listen to podcasts. And it's audio variety. We're going to talk about Josh Pate's Big 12 power rankings. Where does TCU fall in the new Big 12? I do want to quickly clear something up, though, because uh, like a year ago, so I'm from a small town, McGregor, Texas. That's where I live now. And I wore a McGregor hat on the show. And a bunch of people came at me and they're like, why the heck are you wearing a Michigan Wolverine hat? on uh, a Locked On TCU podcast because it's McGregor's logo is the big block M and it's black and gold. So I guess the color scheme kind of matches. This is a, uh, so today I'm wearing a Gatesville Hornets pullover. It's not a Grambling State logo, even though it looks like it. I'm not, nothing against Grambling State. Eddie Robbins is one of the greatest coaches ever. I like their uniforms, but understandably people got after me for wearing another college's logo. If you're wondering, Gatesville is another small town near where I am and a family friend playing a playoff game tonight, basketball playoff game by district round. So, you know, if you're into four, a hoops, then I'm, I'm the guy to talk to, but this is, I, this is a TCU podcast and I'm not repping Graham Wayne state gear, even though I have nothing against them and no beef with them. But just to clear that up, because last time I, I wore some local high school gear, people, people kind of got on me uh, for my loyalty. So, Today, we're talking about the new look Big 12 and where TCU stands in the power rankings. Uh, Josh Pate, who works for CBS Sports, 247 Sports, he put together um, a look at the new Big 12. And I think one of the more interesting conversations ever since Texas and Oklahoma left, there's been this discussion. Even though OU, they dominated the league for a long time, the last few seasons they, they didn't but they had that long stretch where they were winning titles every year. And the question was, okay, who's going to become the new standard bearer? Who's going to be the, the team that runs the new conference? And I feel like every Big 12 holdover felt like they had an argument or had a case as to why they could do that. And I think TCU's in a great position if they can sustain success and find consistency. That's really the key for the Frogs. It's been such a roller coaster over the last five years. You have to find a way to, you know, win seven to nine games on a consistent basis. And then every other year or so, take it to the next level and contend for a Big 12 title or contend for a playoff spot, all those different things. But everyone sort of had the the same argument of, well, you know, school X, whether it's TCU, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, um, Baylor, everybody's like, we got a lot of resources. It's good location, good recruiting ground. There's an opportunity for all these schools to kind of jump up and be the the new standard bear in the conference. And then we've also seen arguments like I know the guys from the 1012 network, uh, which is a TCU pod or a Big 12 podcast network. They've talked about how they don't really think we're going to see another Oklahoma-esque run with any of the new schools. We th- they think it's going to be kind of each and every year. It's turnover. And Sonny Dykes talked about this with R.J. Young from Fox Sports recently. He said he thinks the great thing about the league moving forward is it feels like there's a lot of parity. So each and every year you're going to have great competition. You're going to have new teams that could find a way to be in the championship discussion. So Josh Pate put together his uh, Big 12 rankings. And he said that the way he, he ranked these, these schools, so you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go with power rankings. Is it who's going to win the league this year? Is it the best programs moving forward? So he ranked this based on the last three years of results and then talent acquisition and resources moving forward. So it's a combination of what have you done over the last three seasons? How are you recruiting? And then what does your ceiling look like? Um, as we we look at the next five to six years, right? So here's here's the rankings that he put together. 
He's got Utah at one, K-State at two, Oklahoma State at three. You can see this graphic on YouTube if you're watching. Texas Tech at four, TCU at five, Kansas at six, UCF at seven, Arizona at eight, Iowa State at nine, Colorado at 10, West Virginia at 11, Houston at 12, Arizona State at 13, Baylor at 14, BYU at 15, and Cincinnati at 16. So TCU at five. The four schools behind them, uh, or in front of them, excuse me, Utah, K-State, Oklahoma State, and Texas Tech. And I think for the most part, this is pretty fair. Now, I will argue this, or I would say this. If we're talking about teams that have the highest ceiling moving forward, the best ability to really run the show as we look into the future, I think TCU has the best argument for that. I feel like TCU has the best, has the highest ceiling in the Big 12. They are the team, they are the program that can consistently be at the top of the league if Sonny Dykes can figure this out and get them to a place where they're playing at a high level each and every year. The challenge for TCU is going to be consistency. You have to find a way, even in your down years, even in your rebuilding years, if you want to put that in quotes, to be successful and sustain success. Because in the last three seasons, we saw a team that went five and seven and then went 12 and one, in the regular season, won a playoff game, made the national title game, and then came back down to earth again and once again went five and seven. So how do you find that middle ground? But I do think it's interesting because when we look at these four schools that are ahead of them, Utah, K-State, Oklahoma State, and Texas Tech, I wanted to assess and kind of see, okay, where have these schools been over the last four years? So Utah, um, the last three seasons, 10-4 and in 2021, won a Pac-12 title, lost in the Rose Bowl. 10-4 in 2022, again, won a Pac-12 title, lost in the Rose Bowl. And then last season, they went 8-5 and five with Cam Rising at quarterback. And I think Utah and Kansas State have a lot of similarities. Utah under Kyle Whittingham, they have a very high floor. And what I mean by that is, last year we saw the best example of this. Their quarterback was out basically all season. He was out all season. Cam Rising was going to be their starter. He was out all year. So they were shuffling back and forth between QBs. They didn't have an effective offense because of that. They still found a way to win eight games. It wasn't pretty. They got beat pretty handily in some of those ball games, but they found a way to win eight games even when they weren't their best. And it's a testament to what he's built there. They have a clear identity. They're tough. They're physical. They're going to play good defense. They recruit at a kind of middle of the road level. It's not elite, but it's good players who are going to develop over time and they're going to have their QB back this year in Cam Rising, and we'll see what they do in year one of the Big 12. Kansas State, over the last three seasons, 8-5, and 10-4 and four with a Big 12 championship and a Sugar Bowl appearance that they lost, and then 9-4 and four in 2023. So you see with both these teams, not the highest of highs like TCU had a few years back, but consistently 8-10 to 10 wins, in the conference title discussion. And last year, K-State had some transition at quarterback, but still really solid. And, again, a team that is has a clear identity. Physical, run the ball well, good up front, play solid defense. That can win you seven to nine games. The challenge for TCU has been lately – the highs have been high, but the lows have been pretty low. Now, they haven't completely bottomed out and gone three and nine or two and 10 or something like that, but the five and seven seasons are pretty glaring. The lack of bowl eligibility is an issue. Oklahoma State, uh, 12 and two in 2021, lost in the Big 12 title game, ended up winning the Fiesta Bowl that year, though. Seven and six um, in 2022, and that team really faded down the stretch. And then 10 and four in. Um, the last season made the Big 12 title game, lost to Texas. Now, I think they benefited last year from one of the things about the new Big 12 and the uneven schedule is there are going to be seasons where your schedule is just easier. And Oklahoma State um, had a lighter schedule, but they still won huge games. I mean, they won the last Bedlam ever, essentially, uh, which was a, a massive ball game. Um, and they lost to Texas in the Big 12 Championship, but they handled their business for most of the year. It was a bizarre season, though. They also lost to um, South Alabama. They got destroyed by UCF in the middle of the year. I don't think that was one of Gundy's more talented teams, but again, you see the proof of concept and you see the consistency. And in 2022, they went 7-6, and six, which was a down year for them, but they still found a way to win seven games, even with all the issues. 
And then this past year, in typical Mike Gundy fashion, when everyone sort of buries them and is like, oh, they're going to be horrible, they find a way to be effective and be a good team and hang around. And they've kind of done that year after year. So that's the big similarity I see with the first three schools, which is the consistency. Now, the issue I have is I think you flip Texas Tech and TCU because Texas Tech over the last three years, I guess you can argue they've had more success I mean, but they went they went seven and six, eight and five, and seven and six. So they're essentially a five hundred team. They won a couple bowl games. They were bowl eligible in all those years. But that's about the only advantage they have over TCU. I honestly would take that twenty twenty two season over three years of seven and six football. Last year they were supposed to be really good, and they were. I mean, they're better. They improved under Joe McGuire, and I think he's a good coach, and he's shown that he has the ability to get you you know, between six to eight wins. But I would just argue there's not a huge difference between what they've done and what TCU has done over the last three years. And the high for TCU is so high that it outweighs the consistency level that the Red Raiders have had. I assume maybe Josh also put them above TCU because people kind of – I always think talking about NIL is tricky because it's hard to know exactly what everybody's numbers are. Like, I I know there's a lot of people that think TCU is falling way behind in that regard, but I just don't see a lot of proof of that. I mean, I guess this this past year's recruiting class would be the biggest example if you want to make that argument. But, I mean, it was still, you know, in the mid-30s. Like, it wasn't like they completely fell off a cliff. And if whether or not you think this is spin, I'm going to kind of give the reasoning behind TCU's philosophy here. And if you think this is them just spinning the tail to – justify what they're doing on the trail and that's fine but they've you know they've kind of come out and said their philosophy when it comes to nil is they're going to use a lot of those resources for player retention and improving players in the portal and they're not going to dip so much in the world in paying high school players a ton of money now is that a way to be good on a consistent basis i think it's remained to be seen i feel like you still have to build through the high school ranks but that's been their strategy so far under Sonny Dykes, at least according to people in the know. Um, Whether or not that pays off, we'll have to see over the next few seasons. But I I just – I know Texas Tech has a mad door club and they've been effective at, you know, paying guys a a base salary essentially, like a good decent amount of money for all the football and basketball players across the board. Um, and they landed Micah Hudson, who's a five-star wide receiver and a great player. I got to watch Micah at Lake Belton. He's fantastic. I think he's going to be a really good player at the next level. He's going to make an impact immediately. But I don't get the sense that Tech is just, you know, beating the doors off of everybody from a recruiting standpoint in the Big 12 yet. And so until I see that, the fact that they've kind of been hanging around 500 over the last three years, I just take issue with them being above TCU. But, you know. We're, we're sort of splitting hairs there. I feel like the good news for the Frogs is there's potential for them to be really good and be in a spot where they are consistently in the Big 12 title race. Um, but it starts with putting together, again, consistently good seasons and not having down years. You know, yeah, injuries are going to happen. You're going to have seasons where you're just not as talented or there's maybe key spots where you don't have um, the depth and the roster that you need. But you have to find a way to establish an identity and be a team with a high floor, meaning you're not just going to completely fall out of it and fall off a cliff if you don't have everything, you know, aligning and the stars aligning and everything kind of falling into place. You can still find a way to win seven to nine games. And we'll see what that looks like this year for the Frogs when they take the field. Uh, we're going to talk some TCU basketball in a minute. I did. I do want to mention – I checked out a little bit of uh, TCU football has been doing these things on Instagram, like live look-ins and their off-season workouts, which I don't glean a lot of insight from these things. I mean, I've I've watched a few of them, um, and it is cool to get the the behind-the-scenes look at it. I don't really – I don't – like, I'm not watching it like, oh, man, there's so much that I can learn from this as much as it's just kind of entertaining. But today they had um, Max Duggan and Darius Davis and D. Winters were all – it was kind of like they were FaceTiming the team. They were all there on Instagram Live watching the team work out. The team was doing some competition stuff when I was watching, like, tug of war, that type of thing. And the guys were 
talking to former players. It was just cool to see the camaraderie. I mean, obviously the current players have a ton of respect for those dudes and, you know, they're not that far removed from being there. So there's still guys that they know really well. You know, they all said, what's up to Josh Hoover. Uh, they all said hi to Bud Clark. It was just kind of cool to see those, those players interact with each other again, but yeah, TCU football off season in full swing as we are barreling towards another season. When we come back, we'll talk some TCU hoops. It's locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day. This show is brought to you by FanDuel today. FanDuel, it's where the game starts. Go to fanduel.com slash locked on. Get up to $150 in bonus bets with any $5 winning bet. That's right. You just put $5 down. You win that bet. You get $150 in bonus bets. You can do quick bets, same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on. Again, that's fanduel.com slash locked on. Or use their safe, secure, and easy to use app. FanDuel is official betting partner of the NBA and a proud sponsor of the Locked On Network. FanDuel is the best place to uh, try to make some money. You love sports. You do this all the game, all the time. FanDuel is where the game starts. FanDuel.com slash Locked On or the FanDuel app. So I do want to mention briefly before we get to uh, some TCU hoops talk, um, TCU in men's tennis, they went to the indoor ITA national championship tournament this weekend and they finished second. They actually lost the national title match to Ohio state yesterday. They won the doubles points. They took a quick one, nothing lead. Uh, Jake Fernley and Jack Pennington won their singles matches, which gave them three points. They just needed one. They just needed to win one more singles match to take on the national title. But um, apparently Ohio state is really deep uh, with their singles lineup. And so, uh, the guys, unfortunately, just couldn't do it. Uh, Lou Maxey took his uh, match, Robert Cash, to three sets, but just couldn't finish it off. And so the Frogs fall at the Indoor Tennis Championships. Um, unfortunate. I mean, it would have been really cool to see a three-peat. But Ohio State was ranked number one uh, going into this tournament. They're the one seed. TCU was the two seed. And it looked like the top two teams in the country going at it, honestly. So hopefully the Frogs get another shot at them. I know Texas is also great, and TCU will see them in the Big 12. Baylor's typically pretty solid. There's a lot of great Big 12 teams um, in men's tennis that will get them ready for the outdoor tournament. And the outdoor tournament is actually an NCAA-sponsored event. This is just kind of a one-off. Um, it's not really midseason. I guess it's early season indoor tournament they play. But TCU have won that championship two years in a row. But if you can win the outdoor title, then it's an actual NCAA-sponsored entity, which is cool. So maybe this will be the year that they break through on those courts as opposed to the indoor courts. But shout out to David Roditi and his squad. I mean, that's a um, – we talked about consistency, right? Like they are consistently a top 10 team in the nation, top five team in the nation. Um, they've been in it for a long time now. So it's really awesome what he's built. And I'm I'm not an expert on tennis at all, so it's not something that I can really break down in depth. But I know I know good programs and I respect, you know, uh, teams that are there each and every year. And that's a special group that they've been able to put together with TCU men's tennis. Okay, so TCU basketball coming off a really good win against Kansas State. Jameer Nelson Jr. hits a essentially a buzzer beater, hit a shot with 1.1 seconds left, hit a, a fall away three to win that game 79-76. They take on Texas Tech tonight at 8 p.m. at United Supermarkets Arena. Um, always a tough environment there in Lubbock. 8 p.m. start should be a good one. And uh, Frogs won this game in, in Fort Worth and won it pretty handily, honestly. Tech had a lead. Uh, for most of the first half, but TCU went on a run late in the first half to um, take a lead going into halftime, and then never really relinquished it in the second half uh, and got it done. So uh, Red Raiders looking for revenge. It's going to be a tough matchup. Tech's a good good team, man. They've been um, solid all year long. Grant McCaslin, first-year head coach. Uh, Pop Isaacs is their main scorer. He's averaging 16 a game. But they also got Joe Toussaint, who's averaging 12 a game. Um, a couple health notes. So Ernest Uday, I can't really speculate on what his status is going to be. I haven't heard an update from Jamie Dixon, uh, but Ernest, the big man in the middle, had an ankle injury, or it appeared like it was an ankle lower leg injury in that K-State game in the first half. Missed the rest of the game. Um, and so he's, he's a key because he's just a great rim protector. And you saw late in that ball game, Kansas State just started going to the rim at will 
because they knew they didn't have to worry about, you know, having a, a great shot blocker in the middle like Uday. Um, and then specifically for the Texas Tech matchup, Warren Washington, who's a name that should be familiar with Frog fans. He played at Arizona State last year, and so they saw him in the NCAA tournament. He transferred to Tech this season, had a really good game against the Frogs in that first matchup in Fort Worth. He's also questionable with a foot injury. So if Washington can't go, then I'm a little less concerned about not having Uday in the lineup. Um, but bottom line is you need him long-term down the stretch. He is he's very limited offensively, but he's a good defensive presence. He helps that team out a lot, and um, they need to get Ernest fully healthy. So we'll see where he stands. You know, one thing that I'm curious about as we go down the stretch here for the Frogs is the guard play has really fallen off. Like Avery Anderson has struggled mightily lately. Jameer Nelson Jr. is very streaky. And Trey Tennyson, I think, is a good player, but, I mean, he's a guy that is not going to create his own offense a lot. Like, he, you have to run sets for him to run him off screens and find ways to get him open looks. But somebody's got to step up and be kind of the primary scorer again from that position. I mean, Micah Peavy has been outstanding. I love what he brings to the table. Emmanuel Miller has obviously been consistent all year long. You know, they're going to get some points from their bigs at times. Um, but who's the guard that really starts leading the charge here as we get there into March? Because guard play is how you you go deep in the tournament and you win big games. So TCU could uh, could really use some stability at those positions. But TCU and Texas Tech, 8 p.m. tip at United Supermarkets Arena in Lubbock uh, should be a fun one. Again, we'll, we'll get updates later today. I know Warren Washington practiced for Tech yesterday, according to their head coach, Grant McCaslin. So we'll see if he's able to go, and then Uday as well, what his status is um, as these two teams match up for a second time this season. would be a big win with them two games – with the Frogs two games over 500 and Big 12 play, and they get Cincinnati this weekend, which is uh, another game that um, – it's just one of those games, Cincinnati on the road, that they dropped unnecessarily and was, was a tough L. So hopefully they can bounce back and get some revenge when they see the Bearcats on Saturday. But first, first things first, play Texas Tech tonight. When we come back, we'll talk some baseball and get to uh, your thoughts, some audience reaction. Locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day. All right, LinkedIn jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, uh, you can't waste time. And it's a it's a huge proposition, right? You have to find the right people for your business. Go to LinkedIn.com slash Locked On College. You guys check out LinkedIn jobs. Um, it's not just another job board. They have a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. They give you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. Hiring is easy when you have that many qualified candidates. In fact, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. That's why they're always finding ways to make the process easier. Two and a half million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college. Post your job for free. Make it easy on yourself. LinkedIn is the number one name when it comes to talent acquisition and hiring people. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Post your job for free there. All right, closing things up here on Locked On Horn Frog. So TCU baseball back in action at home again tonight. A long homestand to start the season. So get UCLA. At home this weekend, Bruins ranked uh, 20th in the country, I believe, in the D1 baseball rankings. So big non-conference matchup coming up. And then against Texas State tonight, one thing I'm watching for, uh, Ben Hampton, the West Virginia transfer. He should get the start. So curious to see what he does against the Bobcats. Texas State's become a really good baseball program here in the last few years. Um, you know, Hampton's a guy that I thought would be in the weekend rotation. He didn't start the year that way. And obviously – Frogs had some struggles with their starting pitching to start the year. So maybe this is a chance for him to um, show something. And I said this before the season, you know, it, it, I think it really is a big luxury. We'll have to see how it works out and what he does and how effective he is. But it's been a while since TCU had an experienced starter in this role. Typically your Tuesday night guy is younger guys that you're trying to get some experience, right? Let them um, have a chance to, to get after it and get their feet wet against non-conference competition. And, uh, you know, Hampton has a chance to really solidify things and be a consistent starter in that role. So I'm excited to see what he does. Six o'clock first pitch against the Bobcats and then that series 
against UCLA coming up this weekend, but the Frogs have a chance to start 4-0, which would be really good if they can uh, if they can find a way to do it. Um, some audience reaction from yesterday's show. I talked about that big win for TCU basketball. Jim Norris said, Jameer Curry, um, what a shot. I turned on the game, and they were down eight, and then PV went nuts. Yeah, uh, Micah PV was outstanding in that ball game. I mean, really, you can't say enough about who he is and what he did and how he got it done for the Frogs, uh, led that team back, willed them back. And that was a crazy shot by Jameer. Still don't really know how he hit that, but I'm thankful that he did. And big-time win uh, for the Frogs there. Jacob Langford said he was at baseball game on Sunday. Offense looked great all weekend. Need to figure out pitching and defense, and he's heartbroken for men's tennis. They should have won it. Yeah, it was tough, man. It's a tough match. Um, as I said, it just felt like two great teams going at it. So hard to be mad about it. Obviously disappointed, but um, sure a good you know, learning experience for them too getting to see Ohio State up close like that. And, you know, baseball, yeah, I'm not going to worry too much about the pitching yet, but they got to figure it out. The defense, also, you can't extend innings. You can't allow big innings, and that's typically the quickest way to do it is by, you know, having errors and just giving guys extra outs. And then Matt Clark said the refs did everything they could to screw us in Manhattan. Refs in Kansas in general have not been our friend. Doesn't bode well for our Big 12 tournament hopes. Um, yeah, that was a tightly called game. That was still such a bogus foul call to me, though, at the end there. And, uh, you know, people have commented on it a lot. Big 12 officiating is an issue. It's it's a great league. It's a great basketball league. Basketball officiating, I think, is really difficult because it's so subjective. But um, there's just way too many whistles, and games are call, called so tightly. And just in that situation, I thought one TC would had caused a five second violation, but also I just felt like there wasn't much contact, and you got to let the teams play through it. But we'll be back tomorrow with your action to tonight's basketball game and more. It's locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day.